All right, guys, the projector's warming up. I'm going to go ahead and start talking just a little bit. Uh, if the bulb goes out at any point today, the new one's been ordered. But if the bulb goes out, I'll just start writing on the board. I won't expect you to write a million things, but I'll, I'll leave the computer screen up where I can see as you were flipping. But we'll just do the best we can if the screen goes out, okay? All right. We have made it to the small intestine, right? That's kind of where we stopped last time. That means so far we have talked about ingestion, right? Putting the food in the mouth. What happens to our food in the mouth? We turn it into a bolus. We do that by mechanically digesting our food. And what, what mechanical digestion happens in the mouth? Mastication, which is the proper name for chewing. Okay? To chew, we need, of course, muscles around our mouth. But what we talked about in here, the important things we need while we chew are our teeth and our tongue. Right? We talked about the structure of teeth. Teeth have several layers. We have enamel on the outside, dentin in the middle, cementum, really hard, holding it to the periodontal ligament. Okay, so it's all important things we talked about. Does any chemical digestion occur in the mouth? Digestion of sugars. Very good. Okay, and today we'll learn a little bit more about the enzymes and how that works. Yes, ma'am. Mastication. Mastication. And that's why, we, if you remember from AMP1, we learned the main muscle for chewing is the masseter. And that's why it's named that, because it's important for mastication. Okay? All right. So after we finished with our food in our mouth, we've chewed it, we started chemically digesting our sugar, we swallowed. And there were two important parts to the swallowing process. What, what's the proper name for swallowing? Oh. Deglutition, good. It's a weird name, right? So we talked about the two parts of deglutition. The first part was the buccal phase. That was the part you control. It's voluntary. You decide when you want to swallow your food, right? We all know that. It doesn't just magically start going down our throat. We have to decide when we want to swallow. After the buccal phase in the pharyngeal esophageal phase, your brain takes over and it becomes an involuntary function, right? Why does your brain take over? Because during that part of the swallowing process, you cannot breathe. So that's why your brain takes over. You can't breathe because as you swallow, the uvula comes up to close off the nasal cavity, make sure your food doesn't go up your nose, and the epiglottis goes down, right, covering the trachea to make sure your food doesn't go into your respiratory system. Okay. After our food goes through the pharynx, it's now in our esophagus. What moves the food through your esophagus? The smooth muscles, right? The circular and the longitudinal muscles. And the function is per the process is peristalsis, which I think I've got a little bit later in the lecture exactly how that works. But we've already talked about that. We squeeze like we would squeeze a tube of toothpaste, just constantly moving that food through the esophagus. Does it just rapidly move through your esophagus? No, it's a slow process. It takes several, it takes at least an hour for your food to get from the top of your esophagus down to your stomach. We talked a little bit about that's why you're supposed to eat slow. That's why you feel like crap after you've eaten really fast because not only is your stomach full, by the time it tells your brain, your esophagus is full too. Okay. Once our food enters our stomach, do we keep it there or do we just keep letting it pass through? We keep it there, right? We close two sphincters. We close the cardiac sphincter at the top, the pyloric sphincter at the bottom, and then we do two different things to our food while it's in our stomach. We mechanically digest it, and we chemically digest it. What, why are we able to mechanically digest our food in our stomach so efficiently? Because of the third muscle layer. Very good. And that's our oblique layer of muscle in our stomach. Allows us to really shake our food around when it's inside of our stomach. Okay. What type of chemical digestion do we do in our stomach? Digest proteins. Very good. And this is one of, the, one of the last things we talked about in our last class. 
In our stomach, we have several very specialized cells that secrete things to help us with the chemical digestion. Okay? We have parietal cells that secrete hydrochloric acid. And what's the pH of that? Two, one to two, very, very low. Okay? And that's going to be important as we talk about the enzymes and how they work today. Okay? So we have that acid. Chief cells secrete our enzyme that digests our protein. We have mucus cells that secrete mucus. Why do we need the mucus in our stomach? We don't have to move it in there. We got all the muscles shaking it around. We got lots of liquid. That's not what the mucus is for in the stomach. For a coating of the stomach. Why are we trying to make a lining to protect our stomach from the acid? Remember, if our acid leaks out of our stomach and comes up in our esophagus, we all agreed that that hurt, right? That's heartburn. That's acid reflux. So we got that nice, real basic, meaning high pH mucus layer in our stomach to protect our stomach from the acid. The other type of cells in the stomach, the enteroendocrine cells, secrete hormones. And what is the two important jobs hormones, the two important jobs that different hormones have in our stomach? Hunger and full. I need one hormone to tell me that I'm hungry. When do we secrete the hormone that tells you you're hungry? When your stomach's empty or when your stomach's full? When your stomach's empty. That's when you're hungry. Your body doesn't know if you ate an hour ago or if you ate six hours ago. That's not what it goes by. It goes by whether your stomach is empty or not. If your stomach is empty, you're going to start secreting the hormone gastrin. And gastrin is going to make your stomach start growling, meaning start moving around when there's nothing in it and trigger you that you need to eat something. Okay? Once your stomach is full, do you need to eat anything anymore? No, there's food there. You're going to be able to break it down to get the nutrition you need from it. right? So you will stop secreting gastrin once your stomach is full and start secreting gastric inhibitory peptide. That will tell your brain you're not hungry anymore. Don't eat any more food. Okay? And someone asked me in my class yesterday, and I don't think we actually talked about this in here, can, does your hormone give up in your stomach? Meaning, have you ever been hungry, stomach's growling, you start thinking, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, and then you didn't have time to eat? Do you just stay horribly hungry the whole time? Your stomach does kind of give up for a minute, but doesn't it remind you a little later that you are hungry? And usually that second time your body tells you you're hungry, it's a little more intense. You kind of get a little lightheaded, right? So the gastrin is not one of those hormones that's going to be just secreted nonstop, full force. You better eat or I'm not going to leave you alone. It's secreted and tells you, you know, I'm hungry. You need to eat something. If you ignore it, it will quit, but it's going to come back a little bit mad at you if you never eat anything. Okay? So that's pretty much where we stopped last time. Right? And we're ready to look at what happens in our intestines. Okay? So we're ready for the food, but we don't call it food anymore. What do we call it now? Time, right? What's the drug, what is the state of time? Does it still look like food? It's pure liquid at that point. It's a mixture of acid and the liquid of your food where you have broken it down into the big pieces, into little pieces. Okay, make sure I don't skip anything. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this right now, but this is something you should put kind of a little star by. This is a figure from your textbook I'm going to refer back to in a minute. This tells you how all your hormones work together, and we're not quite finished talking about all the hormones, but that's a really good figure for you guys to go back and refer to. It's figure 2320 if you don't have your notes printed out. Okay? And again, we, we've talked about all of this. It's just different figures. This is your stomach moving around. shows you it just takes the liquid, lets your liquid move all around in your stomach, really breaks that calm down. Your food's going to stay in your stomach three to four hours. Now we're ready to look at the pyloric sphincter opening up, letting the food out. Okay? Do you think your stomach just, lets, just opens up and all the calm rushes into your small intestine at once? No, because we wouldn't be able to do anything very efficiently with our food if we just dumped all that chyme into our small intestine at once, right? So what's going to happen is your pyloric sphincter 
will open up just a little bit, let one little bit of food squirt out into your stomach, okay? Into, I'm sorry, into your small intestine. Then it'll open up again, let another little bit of chyme squirt out into your small intestine. What part of the small intestine are we going to be putting this chyme into? The duodenum, right? The very first part. And I had a couple people ask me in lab, how do I know which part of the small intestine you're pointing to, right? The duodenum is just the very first little curve of the small intestine. Then you have about 10 feet of the next part, and then about 10 feet of the next part. Okay, so the duodenum is the part where a lot of stuff's going on, but it's just the first little curve, okay, just to make that clarification. All right, now we said once my stomach is full, I'm going to start secreting gastric inhibitory peptide, right? The moment that that pyloric sphincter opens and starts squirting that food into the small intestine, I'm going to secrete my next hormone, which is cholecystokinin. And that is, it's written right here, cholecystokinin. It's always abbreviated CCK. Okay, so, because that's one word that is generally very hard for people to say, definitely hard for you guys to spell. So, that is CCK, cholecystokinin. That is the one we release once we start squirting this food into the small intestine. Okay. Now that our food is in our small intestine, we got to do some more anatomy because in our small intestine, this is the point when we're going to need, of course, the small intestine because the food is there. We're also going to need the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder to do something. Okay? So we got to go through all that anatomy and then we can look at exactly what's going on in this small intestine. Okay? All right. So first off, intestine... Anatomy of the small intestine. We've gone over this in lab. We have three different parts to our small intestine. First is the duodenum, then the jejunum, then the ileum. If you just cut a body open and somebody pulled out all the intestines and showed it to you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the jejunum and the ileum. Only way you know the difference between them is where they are oriented in the body. One is closer to the beginning of the small intestine, so it's closer to the top part of your abdomen, the superior part, okay? Ilium's closer to the lower part, right? When you look at this picture, this shows you the only part of the small intestine that is the duodenum, okay? So just to orient you, this is the liver, gallbladder underneath, this little honeycomb-looking thing is the pancreas. Now, what is missing right here in the picture? Stomach. Yeah, well, spleen's over, spleen's over here too. That's correct. All right. They simply took all of that out so you could see the pancreas. Okay. If you think back to when we dissected our little piggies in lab, right, to find the pancreas, right, you had to pick up the stomach and move everything out of the way. So that's the only reason they took it out of the picture. So this little hole right here, that is where the pylorus, the bottom part of the stomach, would attach. This little hole right here is where the jejunum would start. And then you have all the little twisty parts of the small intestine. Okay? <clears throat> the reason we show the, the, the duodenum in this picture is because of this little hole right here, and there's another little hole right here. Those are extremely important holes in the duodenum. That is where the pancreas and the liver and the gallbladder are going to place secretions, the different things they make and put it into the digestive system, okay? So this is where we are going to do almost all of the digestion of our food, and then we're going to, so we can start absorbing the nutrients. So it's really important that you understand this picture, understand all of these structures, okay? The entire small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, if you cut it open and look at the mucosa, it is modified. And what is the mucosa? What does that word mean? It makes mucus, but what is mucosa? Is the inside layer, right? Okay. Remember, you have mucosa, then submucosa, then muscularis, then serosa, right? We just finished talking about the stomach. The stomach had rugae with the little pits, right, and all the little cells secreting stuff. The small intestine doesn't have rugae, doesn't have the, the gastric pits. It has something called villi. 
the reason the small intestine has villi, and then each of those has little villi on it called microvilli, is to increase the surface area of the small intestine. Okay? So what this ends up making our small intestine look like is basically an accordion. You guys know what an accordion is, right? If it's closed, it's all wadded up and pushed together. That's what your small intestine looks like. If you grabbed an accordion and stretched it out, right, you just wouldn't have the little lines in it. It would stretch out and be bigger. Okay? If we grabbed our small intestine and pulled, it would stretch out just like an accordion does. Okay? Why would we want it to have all that surface area but wad it up into a smaller piece? Do we want our stomachs to be humongous? No, I mean, some of us have a little extra pad in there. We don't really want it there, okay? We wad it all up so we can have a huge surface area, meaning we can have a whole bunch of area for our food to travel over, but we compact it so it can fit into a nice tight place inside of our abdomen, okay? So if I blow up the picture, you can see what it looks like, okay? So if we didn't have villi, right here would be the inside of our small intestine. So as the food was going across here and we were trying to break it down and absorb it, it would go pretty fast, right? If it was a nice smooth surface, it would just go through our small intestine. But what our food has to do as it goes through our small intestine, it has to roll right here and then roll up and roll down and then roll to the next one, roll up and roll down. We slow our food down so we can digest it better. And then not only digest it, we can absorb, meaning take the good stuff out of what we've been digesting a lot better. Because where are we going to put all of that good stuff we've been digesting? Into our blood, right? Down here in the submucosa, you have all of these blood vessels and also lymphatic vessels where we're going to put the good stuff, okay? Like, to get just through the small intestine, I couldn't tell you. But from the process of eating to pooping is about two days. Through the whole, so probably through the whole small intestine, almost a day. And then you got several, probably at least 12 more hours through the large intestine. Okay? So what you ate this morning, you're not going to see, what day is it, Wednesday? You wouldn't see again until Friday. Okay? And if you want to test that, eat something you can't digest and then look for it. And you think that's funny and gross. People that have children, that's how you know when they get rid of something they weren't supposed to eat that they ate. You just wait for it to come back out. And it generally, if you go to the doctor freaking out, oh, my God, my kid ate a penny, what's going to happen? They're going to tell you, well, in about two days, you're going to see that penny again, and you'll see it shining in their poop. Okay? Not telling you to go home and eat a penny, but if you're curious, that's how you could find out, because everybody's is a little different speed. Some people would see that penny in a day. Some people wouldn't see that penny for a week. Okay? All right? Now, the very, if we blow up one little end of the villa, we even have microvilla. Why do that? That just makes you have even more surface area in that little spot. So not only does the food travel over each one, but it has to do this as it goes along each little villa. Really, really slow. Now, if we look, this is it's in a way similar to the stomach because we do have some different types of cells that can do different things, but it's not secreting specific things depending on the type of cell like we saw in the stomach. We pretty much have mainly mucus cells secreting mucus. We're back in an organ just like the esophagus where all we're doing is moving stuff through, so we're secreting the mucus to help keep things moist move things through. But if we look, every now and then we do have some specialized cells that are going to secrete what we call brush border enzymes. And again, we're going to talk about those and we'll put all the enzymatic digestion together and talk about it. Um, the other type of modification we see, some cells are better at absorbing than others. But it's a kind of a distinction we're not really going to worry about too much here. We're just going to say collectively all of this is absorbed across the small intestine. Okay, so if you're wondering what all this stuff labeled is, I'm not really going to worry about that too much. Okay? All right. So we've already said we have this mucus. We secrete it, help move things, help transport it through. 
All right, so let's go through the anatomy of the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, and we're finally going to get to talk about the majority of how we're going to digest this food. Okay? Your liver is the largest gland in your body. Why am I calling it a gland instead of an organ? What does gland make you think? Secretion. Because your liver, it does a few other little things, but its main job in your body is to produce and secrete something very important. We call something an organ when it's able to do more than just secrete something. So that's why it is called a gland. And I can remember, oh my gosh, let me think about how many years ago it was, probably seven years ago when I took the MCAT for the first time, entrance exam for medical school, I missed this question. And I'll never forget it. They asked me a question about the liver as to whether or not it was a gland or an organ. And now I remember thinking, oh, I have no idea. I can tell you exactly what it does. So that's why I make a big deal about this. Because if y'all ever see that trick question again one day, y'all aren't going to miss it like I did. All right? This is a gland, and the scientific definition difference between them is a gland's major job in the body is to secrete, and organ's major job is to secrete plus some other function. Okay, but y'all all seem to know it. Apparently, I'm just stupid. Y'all got it right. All right. I mean, I got to learn every little piece of structure, but I do think you should be able to tell me that this is a front view, an anterior view of the liver. How do I know that? Because you got a bigger portion going down right here on the right. The right, lo the right lobe of the liver is larger than the left. Why? What's down here in the way? The stomach, the pancreas, all those large organs sit right over here. Okay? Also, you see the little sac-like organ over here on the right. That's the gallbladder. Okay? There's a very large ligament called the round ligament that separates these two major right and left lobes of the liver. Okay? There's two smaller lobes, the caudate and the quadrate lobe on the back. I would never expect you to label those. Okay? But the main thing for me is I think you should be able to tell the difference between the right and the left, the front and the back. Okay? At least be able to orient it correctly. Okay? Now this is a picture of a human liver. Okay? We've all seen the liver in the little piggy. Did he have a big liver to be such a small little animal? So what do you think your liver looks like? It's big. All right? It is, if you took both your hands, kind of spread out your fingers, laid it below your ribs, that's where your liver is. And your liver is, is large. Okay? Now, if someone has cirrhosis, they are a heavy drinker, the liver actually will shrink and get all shriveled up and nasty looking. If you ever want to see a gross picture, search that on the internet. It's pretty nasty. It turns black. It's really gross. Okay? Now, but looking at this real picture, it's kind of hard to see some of the ducts. And a duct is what we use to transport a secretion from one place to the other. So I'm going to kind of go to the cheesy pictures to point all that stuff out. Okay? So with this liver, it's going to have one main job for, as far as the digestive system is concerned. It's got other stuff. But one main job. The liver makes bile. Okay? And bile is going to be important for the digestion and absorption of our fat. Again, we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, what else do you think the liver is going to do for us? Just guessing. It's got to have something to do with blood. Very good. Why would you know that? Because look at this picture. What color is it? Deep red. In that dead, dissected animal, all the other organs are just kind of blah colored, right? What color was that liver? brownish red, right? Because its other jobs in the body are all going to be related to blood, breaking down red blood cells, storing parts of your red blood cells, things like that. Okay? But as far as we're concerned, we're worried about the bile. All of the ducts in the liver are called hepatic ducts. Okay? And I'm going to flip back and forth between pictures, so you all just kind of look for a second. Okay? This is what the liver looks like on a microscopic view. Okay? It's, it's turn into these little hexagons, these little six-sided um, structures. Each one of these has tons of little tiny ducts running through them. We call them bile canaliculi. Y'all remember where y'all seen that word before? 
in the bone. Good. A cantalicula is just a little bitty channel. Okay, these are just little bitty ducts. Because what's going to happen is each one of these individual little bitty hepatocytes, little liver cells, are going to make bile. And these little green ducts, these bile ducts, are going to form like little channels for all that bile to drain into. They get bigger and bigger at the side of each one of these little hexagon structures. You have a larger bile duct. Okay? It gets the bile. The bile keeps collecting until ultimately the ducts get bigger and bigger. Once the ducts get to a certain size, we call them hepatic ducts. Okay, why am I making a big deal about this? Because a bunch of people ask me this in lab. Well, it says right and left hepatic duct. Do we need to be able to tell the difference? Well, not really, because there's going to be more than two hepatic ducts. Okay? There may be 25 little ones that join together and make 12 that are a little bit bigger. Then those 12 will join together and make four that are a little bit bigger. Then those four will join together and join these right and left hepatic ducts that you can see. Okay? They're just kind of all collectively called hepatic ducts once they get big enough. Just like we call all of our arteries arteries once they get big enough. We call them arterioles once they get small enough. Okay? Everybody understands that comparison? Good. So after our liver, inside of those little hexagon structures, after we make the bile, it drains all together, goes through the hepatic ducts, drains through the common hepatic duct, which just made it bigger, and over here through the cystic duct, and into the gallbladder. The only major function we need to worry about with the gallbladder is that it stores the bile that the liver makes. Okay? The gallbladder is going to store that bile until we need it. Okay? So, can you live without your gallbladder? Yeah, people do it all the time. Okay? How could you live without it? Because does does the gallbladder make anything we need? It's just a storage site. That's how you can live without it. If you don't have a gallbladder, it's, it's fine. Your liver can still make the bile, but it just has to constantly drain down. You just can't squirt a giant chunk of bile into your small intestine when you need it. So it's a little harder for people without their gallbladder to digest fats, but they still can. They still have the bile. Okay? All right. So just to point a few things out in the notes that we've been talking about, okay? Here's telling you what the components of bile are. Bile is a really nasty looking greenish substance, pretty liquidy. It is composed of lots of different things. I don't really care that you know all the components. But what's important for you to understand is that bile is composed of some fats, which are nonpolar, and some components, like the breakdown, the bilirubin, which have a charge. And that's going to be important when we talk about what it does. Right? So just to kind of give you a little bit of a drawing to help some of you. Okay? When, when we're in a scientific setting and we draw something nonpolar, it's a big long chain of, mo of a molecule, we kind of do the little zigzag line. Okay? What does nonpolar mean? Do we all understand that? Uh-oh, maybe not. Has no charge. Okay? Is, water, is water polar or nonpolar? Water's polar, right? Water is H2O. So we got two H's, one O. The O is negatively charged. The H's are positively charged. Okay? Very, very charged, very, very polar. Okay? Fats are nonpolar. Water is polar. Okay, we're gonna have us a little chemistry lesson. Can something fatty dissolve in water? No. You've all cooked something before, put it in the refrigerator and pulled it back out, right? And there's that thick, clumpy stuff on the top. That's the fat that comes out because the fat can't dissolve in water. Okay? All right. So bile has the nonpolar part and a polar part. Okay, so, so I'm drawing bile over here. Okay, so this part of the bile is polar. This part of the bile is nonpolar. So can that bile interact with water? 
Does bile have a charge on it? Yes. So one part of the bile can interact with water. The other part of the bile that's nonpolar will interact with something that's nonpolar. And what are we talking about in the digestive system that's nonpolar? Fats. Don't you eat fat? You live in Mississippi? You eat fat. You eat a lot of it. Okay? So this is the part of it that's going to interact with the fat that we eat. This is the part of it that's going to interact with the water, which is basically the liquid part going through. Okay? So that's the stuff I kind of expected you to know. You should have learned this in the little chemistry section in biology. But if you didn't, that's fine. Does that make sense? Difference between polar and nonpolar. In order to be able to dissolve in water, it's got to have a charge. Okay? Fats cannot dissolve in water because they're nonpolar. That makes sense? Okay. So that's what bile looks like. Part of it's nonpolar, part of it's polar. That's, that's all I expect you to understand. Okay? We already talked about the gallbladder. It's a storage site. A little sac sits underneath the liver, stores that bile for us. It's only going to squirt the bile out when we need it. When, do I have that picture again? No, I'll go back. When are we going to need our gallbladder to squirt the bile out into our small intestine? When there's food in the small intestine. That makes sense, right? I don't need to squirt it in there. If I don't have any food, I need help digesting, right? What hormone did we say we were going to secrete as the food left our stomach and went into the small intestine? CCK. So whenever we release CCK, one of the major jobs of our CCK, the reason we are secreting it is to tell the gallbladder, Go. You need to go. You need to do your thing. You need to secrete the bile into the small intestine. That is one of the major jobs of that hormone, is saying, food's here. You need to secrete the bile. Okay? Does CCK tell the liver to do anything? No. Your liver is continuously functioning, continuously making bile, and just storing it in the gallbladder. Whenever the food gets in the small intestine, you release CCK. CCK tells the gallbladder, secrete the bile. Everybody still with me, right? We're doing this in pieces, and you'll understand why when you see how complex it is. Okay? So now we need to look at the pancreas. The pancreas has been talked about before in this class, right? Anybody remember what we talked about the pancreas for? Hormones. The pancreas was in the very first chapter on endocrines, endocrine system. The pancreas secretes two hormones. Do you remember what they were? Insulin and glucagon. What were those two hormones responsible for in our body? Regulating blood sugar. Does it make sense that an organ that we use in the digestive system would be involved in the amount of sugar in our blood? The, is the digestive system involved in the amount of sugar in your blood? Yes, because that's how we get sugar in our blood. We digest the food and we put it into our blood. Okay? So that should be a connection you can kind of make in your mind. Just for those of you that don't remember, insulin is your hormone that tells you you have sugar in your blood. Glucagon is kind of your, one of your hungry hormones. tells you there is no sugar in my blood. You need to eat. Okay? Insulin says don't eat. Okay? What we're worried about now is looking at something new, the exocrine function of the pancreas. Okay, and if I flip to a little picture, inside of your pancreas, you have lots of different types of cells, but you have something called acinar cells. These little cells secrete enzymes. And what are enzymes for? Breaking down your food. So they're going to secrete the enzymes. And where do these ducts ultimately go to squirt all of these enzymes? Into the duodenum, right? So here's our pancreas. This is the little duct. So inside of those last in our cells, we're secreting all of our digestive enzymes. And they ultimately get squirted into the small intestine. 
Okay. They are going to be part of the pancreatic juice. Okay. The pancreas secretes all of these enzymes plus one other thing. The other thing it secretes is a very alkaline solution. What does alkaline mean? Basic, high pH. Why do we need the small intestine to have something squirted into it that's high pH? To neutralize what? The chyme that's being squirted out of the stomach. What's the pH of the chyme coming out of the stomach? Very, very low, very close to 2 because we had so much acid in our stomach. So we have our nice high pH pancreatic juice full of enzymes. The enzymes we secrete from our pancreas are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxidase, procarboxypeptidase, okay, and a few other ones not on this figure because I'm smarter than your textbook. Okay. The other ones coming from the pancreas, y'all can smile, that's not true. Okay. From the pancreas, are pancreatic amylase, and we need one more coming from the pancreas. Actually, there's more, but pancreatic lipase, and we'll do one more, just to be good and complete. Pancreatic nucleases. All of those come from the pancreas. What's going to tell the pancreas to secrete those into the small intestine? What hormone? CCK. Why do we need C why would CCK tell those hormones to go into the small intestine? When do we need those hormones? I'm sorry, y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm saying the wrong word. When do we need those enzymes in the small intestine? when there's chyme, when the food gets to the small intestine. So for the same reason that CCK told the gallbladder to work, CCK is going to tell the pancreas to work. So those of you making a list of what are the jobs of CCK, he also needs to tell the pancreas to secrete the pancreatic juice, which the main thing we're worried about in the pancreatic juice would be the enzymes. CCK is also going to be a trigger. You really don't need to eat anymore right now. I'm kind of busy. Right? We've already secreted the gastric inhibitory peptide telling us not to eat. We also need that CCK to say, okay, stop eating. Busy. Okay. All right. Let me look and see what's next. Okay, we already talked about CCK. And this is just a nice little figure showing you when to secrete the CCK and everything. I'm trying to see. All right, that's what I thought. All right, so what we're going to do to finish today, I thought we would get to enzymes today, but I don't know if we will or not. What we're going to do to finish today is go ahead and just look at, we're going to assume we've digested everything, we're going to keep moving it through. And then at the very end, we're going to have our discussion on exactly how all of these enzymes work. The reason I'm pushing it to the end is because it is in your best interest to know the structure of a fat, the structure of a sugar, the structure of a protein, the structure of DNA and RNA. Because to really understand how we break it down into stuff we can use, you need to know what it looks like. And that's, that's why I've been kind of pushing it off, because I want to make sure you understand everything and have time to understand that. Okay? So if we just continue and we assume we're ready to keep going with our food, our food has made it all the way through. It's been in the stomach. In the stomach, we, we were secreting the gastrin. We are really working on that food. Then we said, okay, we're full. Gastric inhibitory peptide. I don't need to eat anymore. Stomach finished working on our food. Stomach started squirting the chyme into the small intestine. That triggered the release of CCK. At that point, CCK goes through our blood, right? Comes down here, says gallbladder. I need bile. Bile is squirted out. Pancreas. I need enzymes. Pancreas secretes all that 
enzymes, all the pancreatic juice into the small intestine. We're going to assume we understand at this point, we continue, we break down all of our food, we get all the good stuff we can need out of it, the rest of it just continues. How does it continue through the small intestine? Well, we've already talked about peristalsis. Okay? Peristalsis is just how it moves. We squeeze the circular muscle, then the longitudinal muscle. Circular muscle, then the longitudinal muscle. In addition to that, the small intestine has the ability to do one other type of movement called segmentation. Okay? If I segment this room, what would I be doing? Separating it into little, into little regions, right? Okay. When your small intestine does segmentation, one circular muscle will squeeze, then the next circular muscle ahead of it will squeeze. So what's going to happen to the stuff in the middle of those two circular muscles? They can't move, right? They're stuck there for a second. So what if I start shaking them up a little bit? What would I be doing? I'd be mixing it to help break it down. What would I be mixing the food with in my small intestine that we've been talking about if I did segmentation? The enzymes in the bile. Okay? When you wash your clothes, do you just put the detergent in there and then lay the clothes on top of it and just let it sit there? What's your washing machine do? Constantly churning it, mixing it all up, making sure all the soap touches all the clothes, hopefully, right? So when we do segmentation, we're closing off a region of our small intestine and we say, there's some food here, I need to digest it. And we're shaking it up, making sure all of our enzymes are really mixing, really working on that food. Okay? Remember I mentioned that we have our villi and our microvilli. We have the little brush border enzymes. Your small intestine even makes more enzymes than what the pancreas has already given us as we're doing this segmentation and really shaking everything up. Does that make sense? My washing machine example makes sense? Okay. All right. So which is this a picture of? Peristalsis or segmentation? The big brown clump is what you think it is in the picture. Okay, it's a big piece of poo. It's just peristalsis. How do I know it's peristalsis? What am I doing with the big clump of food? I'm squeezing and moving it, right? That's peristalsis. How would I make this picture be segmentation? There wasn't one in your book. Let's say when I get to this point right here, I've decided I need to digest that a little bit more. So I would close off the muscles right here in front of it. While I did that, inside of here, all my little enzymes would say, hey, here we go, we got time, and they'd start really attacking that food, making sure I had digested all of it. Okay? We are going to absorb all that good stuff, and now we're ready for our food, whatever's left over, to hit the, small inte the large intestine. All right. At this point, the food leaves the ileum, goes to the ileocecal valve, goes into the cecum. The cecum is just this one little part of the large intestine. Okay? All the rest of your large intestine is the colon and then the very end is the rectum. From here to here is the ascending colon. Here to here, transverse colon. Here to here, descending colon. The little loopy part. You go over, up, and down a little. Sigmoid. The reason it's called sigmoid is because that kind of looks like an S. Okay? And then just the bottom part, very muscular is the rectum. Very end, opening to the outside is the anus. Okay? Once your food leaves the ileum, and goes into the cecum, we do not absorb any more nutrition from our food. Okay? We're done with it. If we put it into the cecum, we have decided that's something we can't use anymore. It's a waste product. Okay? But the, the food, I don't really know the best thing to call it, the waste inside of your cecum is not what it looks, it don't look the same in your cecum as it does when it comes out of your anus. So there is still something we need to do to it as we move it through the large intestine. Now I've already told you, 
Some animals don't have a large intestine like we do, right? Okay? They just poop. They just have a straight colon, and their poo just comes out. How does their poo look different than ours? It's green. <laughs> I heard that answer. That's true. It is green. What else? It's not formed. It's a very good way of saying it. It's still really liquidy, right? So what do you think we do in our large intestine to make our feces not as liquidy? We pack it together, and what are we going to take out of it? Water. We absorb water. That is the main job of our large intestine, to get the right amount of water out of our feces. So you start to grin at me. That's okay. I can stand up here anyway and talk. Does it matter how much water we pull out of it? What's going to happen if I pull too much out? You're going to be constipated. You're going to have a hard time going to the bathroom. What if I don't take enough water out of it? You're going to have diarrhea. You're going to run to the bathroom, right? You can become dehydrated by not taking enough water out of your feces in your large intestine. So it is an important job, but is it a necessary job? Could you live without your large intestine? You could, but you wouldn't want to. Okay, what's your question? When you take a laxative, there's different ways laxatives work, but most of your laxatives speed the activity of your intestines. So your food goes through so fast that you don't have time to absorb enough water. And so the question is, well, how does it make you go? Because if you take it, generally it's because you've got something in there that's dried out and hard, and you can't, you're having a hard time getting it out. It builds up so much pressure behind it that it forces that large piece out, and then everything else is going to come out too. When you have a stomach virus, that bacteria or that virus is messing with your intestines, forcing it to come out too fast so that your body's actually trying to get the bacteria or the virus out of your intestines, and it's trying to do it as fast as it can. Well, an enema is they put the they put the liquid into your honey. Exactly. Yes, that's okay. You, I'm gonna tell you something. You're not the only one that wanted to ask it. You're just the only one that that would ask it. I can be honestly say that I never really knew exactly what an enema was until that nurse walked into that room with that contraption when I was in labor, and I was thinking. Hmm, I don't really know about that. But at that point, you don't really care. You have lost all modesty when you're having a baby, so you're all up for it. Um, but, I mean, you can go to CVS and buy enema. You had never seen them sitting on the shelf? You, you can do that yourself. You don't have to go to a doctor to do that. I'm not suggesting it. Why would, why would taking a laxative as a way of dieting be really bad? People do that. You're losing, not your nutrients, what are you losing? Too much water. Inside of your water may not be sugar and the fat components and things like that, but there's a lot of electrolytes, salt, potassium, things like that in your water that you're constantly losing, and it can make you very, very sick. I'm just going to say something else, and I forgot. I'll think of it in a minute. So it's yeah, it's when they do an enema, the the tube is like yeah. It's less, it's probably less than a foot long. I don't know any of you nurses or around. Us, usually I have a usually I'll have an LPN or something in one of my classes. I mean it's it's I don't know. I mean you can't you can't see what they're doing. <laughs> but when they walk in there, it's a, be, a big beaker full of the solution. It's not just water. It's a salty mixture. And I mean the tube is fairly long, but I don't they don't put the whole thing in there. Now when you have a colonoscopy. They feed the whole, I mean, it depends. They feed pretty much through the whole large intestine. Sometimes they go into the small intestine, depending on what's wrong with you. Now, if they need to look at your duodenum in your stomach, they're not going to go up. They're going to go down your throat and go that way. depends on where they're trying to get to. But a routine colonoscopy goes through the entire colon, so all the way over here to the cecum. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Lots of reasons. Um, most of it is people's muscles 
do not function correctly in their intestines. People that are chronically constipated, their muscles don't move like they should. Some people also, throughout your large intestine, you have, the, you have valves which stick out. Some people even have a genetic issue where their valves are larger, so it's harder for it to make it through. If it goes slower, regardless of the reason, you're going to pull too much water out of it, and it makes it hard to go. And some of it also is psychological. Some people will not go to the bathroom if someone else walks in the room. And I mean, I, not saying that I'm just like, oh, whatever, I don't care whoever's around when I'm going, but I mean, some people when they're in a public bathroom will hurt themselves to make sure no one else hears it, like it's a secret. That, they're, they're, that oh my God, I don't want anybody to know I have to do this, and we all have to do it. <laughs> Well, men are generally a little bit more, yeah, open and okay with it than women are. And wasn't that one of you that made the joke, oh, my God, women do that when we were talking about it the other day, just being silly? But, I mean, because it's a little bit different. They don't want to know women do that, but women do as well. All right. Okay, now somebody else has a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, but that goes to the, you, your body is still hungry, but your brain is no longer getting the signal. And that, that's from like we were talking about, you forget you're hungry and then it comes back. It's just because that hormone is not being released anymore. You still need to eat because your body still needs the nutrition from the food. You're just not secreting the hormone to tell your brain to, to be hungry. Does that make sense? That's, that's hard for me to answer and make it make sense. All right. Exactly. People that are people that do not have food, you don't walk around with your stomach growling all the time. Your your body will eventually understand that you're not going to get it. So why should I waste time making this hormone? Also, anybody that's ever tried to diet, okay? I mean, it sucks. I can remember going from being pregnant and eating whenever I felt like or whatever I felt like to trying to teach myself not to eat that anymore. At first, you are starving to death when you only eat that little chicken breast and them two little pieces of broccoli. But after you've eaten that way for a few weeks, your body learns that's what it's going to get. Your stomach does actually kind of, doesn't really get smaller, but it, it will distend and go back to a smaller state and you get full faster because your stomach's not all stretched out and waiting for this big, massive meal it's expecting to get. And just like you can train yourself to expect food at 10 o'clock at night before you go to bed, and then once you don't do it for a week, if you try to eat at 10 o'clock, you feel sick because you're not used to it anymore. And that's all just your hormones telling your brain when you're hungry and when you're not. You can trick your brain sometimes. But, and actually that's that the next thing I'm going to talk about. You can only trick your brain to a certain point. Right? You, can, you have two sphincters to hold your poop in, and your TT is the same way, internal and external. Okay? External, you control. Internal, your brain controls. Okay? That's the difference between having to take a poop and really having to take a poop. Okay? When you just kind of feel like you have to go, both sphincters are closed. If you do not go to the bathroom, your brain is eventually going to open the internal sphincter for you and say, you need to go to the bathroom. It's there. And then you open the external sphincter when you go. With pee and poop, if you continue to ignore your brain telling you you have to go, guess what your brain is going to do? Your brain is going to knock you out, make you pass out so that you'll go to the bathroom. And if you've never seen that happen, you've never been around little kids. Little kids will hold it so long that they'll eventually either just go or pass out and go to the bathroom. That does happen. So next time you're thinking, oh, my God, how embarrassing. I can't go in that public bathroom and go. It'd be a whole lot more embarrassing if you fell out and went right there than if you went in the bathroom and, and went. Okay? And I always used to. It used to be funny to me. I, I watch Chelsea lately every night. That's, that's what I do before I go to bed, generally. Okay? I lay in bed and watch Chelsea lately. And she used to always make jokes about people, adults pooping their pants. I just don't understand. 
There's no way an adult can poop their pants. And then she did. She got a horrible stomach virus, and it happened to her. So the reason I'm telling you this story is, yeah, she's a comedian. She was making it funny, is don't make fun of people. It can happen. There are bad enough stomach viruses that you can't get to the bathroom. It, it does happen. And that's where the brain takes over and says, this is coming out whether you want it to or not. So brain can take over. All right. So this picture right here is a picture of a, the cross-section, someone's anus that is cut. It's not a real picture. It's a diagram. Okay. Now I'm showing you this for two reasons. One reason is to show you this is what those valves look like that I was talking about. That another way to help keeping your, your feces from just coming out. Slows it down. Make sure you get enough of the water out. Other reason I'm showing this picture excuse me, is to show you all of the muscles. Okay? So here's the external sphincter. That's the one you control. Internal sphincter, your brain controls. Last region. reason I show you this is all of these veins that are located at the end of the anus. These are called the hemorrhoidal veins. Do you guys know what a hemorrhoid really is? Okay. It's a expanded blood vessel in the anus. Okay. So you can't say, oh my God, it's so gross. I don't have hemorrhoids. Yes, you do. Your hemorrhoids are just not large and exposed from the outside. You can, people can have one hemorrhoid that is enlarged, and it can be inside of the body, and you would never know it was there. Okay? So you could all have one right now and not know it. So a lot of times when women are pregnant, they'll get hemorrhoids. A lot of times when people are overweight, they'll get hemorrhoids. People that are constipated and pushing and straining and trying to go to the bathroom real hard, they will get those blood vessels that will expand. Okay? They can be inside or they can be down here and they can be exposed to the outside. Okay. Well, that's, a lot of women get them before labor and then they just make it worse during labor. They get them before labor because of the pressure of the baby pushing down all the time. And I don't mean to be gross, but it's when you're pregnant, you have to pee every five minutes, but it gets hard to go to the bathroom because when women are pregnant, your brain is telling you slow contraction of smooth muscle because your body doesn't want your uterus to contract until it's time. Well, your body doesn't distinguish, so even the smooth muscle in your intestine slows down, and all women get constipated when they're pregnant. It's just part, part of life. Some women a little more severe than others, but all women get constipated while they're pregnant. And that's generally why, I mean, like when... Most women get the enema before they have labor. Some older doctors will do it just because they don't want to get pooped on while you're pushing the baby out. But I actually had an enema because they wanted my contractions to speed up, and I refused to take any drugs while I was in labor. So I wouldn't let them give me Pitocin or, or anything. I didn't want any drugs, any painkiller. I didn't want anything while I was having a baby. So they came in there with that enema and it's like, well, if you don't want drugs, we've got to speed this baby coming out one way or another. And that enema stimulated the smooth muscle contractions in my intestines, and that also made my uterus start contract. And I'm not exaggerating. It wasn't 20 minutes. I could feel that baby saying, all right, we're coming out. As soon, you got enema, run to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, come back out. And I said, you know, it, it feels different. Water broke. She was here an hour and five or six minutes after the enema. So, I mean, it... They're very, very closely related to each other, the contractions of those smooth muscles. Aren't y'all glad y'all know so much about me? All right. So we've already talked about what it does. Okay. Process of defecation. Voluntary or involuntary? What you think? Both. Very good answer. Okay. You do generally have to help. Okay. Some of it is voluntary. You do have to contract those muscles. But your brain's contracting smooth muscle. <laughs> Very good. Your smooth muscle is getting it to the end of the tract, and you're just doing a little bit of pushing to get it the rest of the way out. Very good. Okay. All right. <laughs> How many of you have to go take a poop right now? I remember talking about this, thinking, you know, my intestines still kind of full. All right. So what we're going to do next time, we only have 12 slides left, 
it will take us the entire class period next time to go through those 12 slides. Here's what you need to do to understand the next lecture. What is the structure? Don't, and some of you I told you to do this for lab and y'all came in there telling me it's got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. Well, yes, that's true. But that's true for all of them. I want you to understand how a fat, a sugar, DNA, which is a nucleic acid, and a protein look different. Because that's going to help us understand how these enzymes digest them. All we've got left is to look at how the enzymes digest them and how we absorb them and put them into our blood. That's all we've got left.